Hi, guys. What I'll do is I'll start with, um, if you don't mind, I'll start with a video and then I'll do a PowerPoint, but I'll be, it'll be an interactive PowerPoint. So I'll talk during it to like a slideshow. Okay. But I made this uh, video for, um, I was, I was just asked to speak last year at the Chamber of Commerce Thanksgiving lunch. And so I made a little video. So it's a little, it's a little, oh, who's here? How are you, sir? <laughs> Ross is here. So um, I made this little video. So it's a little on the sentimental side, but it kind of tells her story. It's funny how you think that you make something, right? And then people say, well, how did you come up with it? And you think you should have a, it should be a natural progression of where ideas come from. Of course, they come from a place and you first know where they come from. But if you ever came with an idea, you know, it's kind of crap that, that you sometimes you don't know how you really came up with it. So you kind of reconstruct reality and say, well, it's my wife and I, we had this conversation, went to this place and all this stuff. And then you don't always agree with your wife and how you came up with it. Just why are you going on that side of the story? Tell this side of the story. So we try to get our story straight for like, you know, seven or eight years. And uh, I never really liked her side until like I said, but um, so I'm going to try to tell my story a couple of times tonight in different ways. Now you can see a music video. But um, it's a long story, and, and people don't want to hear long stories. So, but you'll, you're gonna, you'll, I'm trying to try to give you a sense of how we came up with this product and why we came up with it. Okay, good enough for now. So we'll start. I want to talk about today was um, you know, you're, not, you're not starting with zero, right? You could always ask for help, and people love to help. So there's that. And also, when you the richer a country you live in, the more um, of their they're not I won't say they're garbage, but their their overflow is available to you. Okay. 
when I moved, uh, when I left, uh, I'll get to that, but yeah, I'll get, I'll get to my story. But um, so that's what we'll talk about today too, is like uh, how much is really available to you um, and, and how uh, helpful people are. Because you saw in the video, we were like, we have a patent, we went to a trade show. We had, we had um, prototype products that were um, made in a single cavity mold. They weren't, they weren't 3D printed. We, we used the 3D printer for our prototype. But they were made in a single cavity mold because we wanted to prove the concept that they could actually be molded. We weren't still sure if it could be molded. But the whole idea is if you could mold something like Lego, then you can make money because they're very expensive. They come out and mold, they're like they're pennies instead of maybe dollars if you're printing, right? So um, we, had, we were at a trade show in, in Charlotte at a, uh, the Astra, the Association of Small uh, Toy Retailers Association. Yeah. American Small, American small, uh, small Toy Retailer Association. And we're there, specialty toy. And uh, we had these blocks that cost 67 cents each because they're made out of single cavity molds. They're still expensive. We had boxes that cost $67. We had t-shirts, right? And we had a pretty blonde with us. And we're like, and we had a video. The video went viral in the hotel the night before, and we had ten thousand dollars in sales on the first morning of the show. And we're like, "Shit, we got to buy a bigger mold." <laughs> so we can So everything in the beginning, especially in the beginning, is all proving the concept. The next level of proving your concept, right? Uh, at first, it's like when you're prototyping, you're just proving that it'll work, right? And there's different levels. You have little. We call them litmus tests of performance. Litmus tests of we want to get to this level. We want to get to that level. For me, it was um, modeling nature. That was my big thing. And I'll talk about that now. But the point, though, is that um, what I'm going to keep hitting on is that that um, you do have these assets and these resources. And most of them need to really start in the beginning from you, right? You don't want to be um, – you want to check your assumptions, right? You want to get into, the, into your mind and how you see reality because – when we're born, we're, we kind of we kind of enter into the temperature of the water. You think it's the normal, right? And it's just temperature of the water. It's normal, right? And it, it might be normal, in, in, but it might be insane. It might be crazy temperature. You're not sure until you expose yourself to other ideas. And in college, I got exposed to some really interesting ideas, like Dr. Buckminster Fuller ideas, where he questioned things, and they're kind of like Elon Musk ideas. The ideas like. A typical question Buckminster Fuller would ask people is, do you know how much your house weighs? And people were like, why the hell would I care how much my house weighs? Well, it's important if you have an airplane. It's important if you have a boat or a car or almost any other thing you'd like to drive around in. Why is it important for your house? Because my house is my castle. That might be your problem if you want to live in a castle. That's why it might cost you like half of your, 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 your earnings if you want to live in a castle. But you might live, so he, so he innovated in lightweight homes. And Elon Musk came up with the same question, why are rockets so expensive? Well, of course they're expensive, they're rockets, right? So asking questions that seemingly sound dumb is part of the early stages that are really important. You can't be afraid to sound like an idiot because you're gonna sound like an idiot anyway, so you might as well. Um, so here's a, this is what comes later, the problem. Current tools available to negotiate 3D space do not allow kids to build at the speed of their imagination, which is mostly like marketing talk, speed of your imagination, what the hell is that? Okay, why are the correct tools important? They develop spatial intelligence, develop fine motor skills, develop an engineering thinking framework, and have hands-on engagement. Those are all important things for teachers especially, because if kids are engaged with their hands, they can get in touch with their mind, right? So a little background about me. I was, I, I was born in 65. I grew up in Chicago suburbs. Um, uh, my grandfather loved JFK. He died only three days after he was assassinated. And I, he, I think he died of a broken heart. Um, this is my father holding a cigarette. That's me. That's my dad's, be my dad's best friend. That's Sam Giancana, the gangster who probably got Kennedy elected in Chicago. Okay. And it wasn't a fan of the Kennedys. I can tell you that after Bobby came after him. So I grew up in a, uh, the two houses down from me. My dad built a home for that guy's Gumar, his girlfriend, okay? Um, my dad built, this is my life as a kid in the 60s. My dad built every home on our block. So I knew the smell of a, of a, of a construction site since I was a little kid. So if I go on a construction site now and smell like freshly cut two by fours, it's like, 
<laughs> right? So, but this was this was my life. These are all the houses my dad built, and um, that, that was just my that was my normal. That my dad built my neighborhood, right? That was you know. Um, one time, a kid from Texas said, "Are you rich?" I said, "No, I'm Mike." <laughs> He got really mad. No, are you rich? I said, no, I'm Mike. I didn't, my cousin was rich, Richie Elstrom. So yeah, but we weren't, we were rich maybe by hillside standards because my dad built it. So Sam Jean, my dad, my dad made a mistake. And this is going to go off color here. But my dad made a mistake of asking Sam Jean Connor if he could drive for him. That means if you're a gangster, they call him the outfit in Chicago. If you drive for somebody, it means it's got to be a part of your crew. You've seen the Sopranos. Like the, and, and Sam Jean kind of famously for my family said, what are you, an asshole? You see my toolbox? We don't have toolboxes. Why don't you build one of those nursing homes for the old people? That's the future. That's like 1958. Okay? So we did. So in our backyard, literally, was what we called the home. And that was a 72-bed nursing home, the Oak Ridge Convalescent Home. And that was my normal. My mom was the administrator. She'd walk every day through the backyard to our, our nursing home. And... Um, uh, there was always spaghetti in the menu because almost all of his first customers were the relatives of the mob. So, yeah, again, normal could be weird, right? <laughs> so, uh, I, I would, so my any kind of building material, he had gar, gar, garages full of buildings. My dad was a hoarder. He kept all the nails and the, everything he kept, right? Um, he's a strategic hoarder, though. He built homes with this stuff. So he built a little pond with a waterfall. He had a, well, you can't see it, but there was a, those big spools. They have a cable, those cable spools. He made a little head. You can't see now. This, this is like recent for the twirl down. He had little dish pans in there, and it was like a, a little water mill, you know? Again, my normal was like, there was goldfish, and it was crazy. It was a crazy little paradise when we growing up. This was on my bedroom wall, Russians and Americans linking up in space. So this is like the milieu of what I grew up in. That was my, this is where my grandparents were buried in, in Mount Carmel Cemetery, Mausoleum. And this was my church with like a spaceship, St. Domitillus. So I'm exposed to architecture. I'm supposed to all design. My dad's a builder. So by the time I'm in sixth grade, I start going to drafting class. Okay, I've been drafting class consistently through sixth grade, through high school, and two years of aerospace engineering, we had no AutoCAD. We had no internet. It was drawing all the time. And as a kid, I used to get the Time Life books of the Cowboys. One of those books, the Time Life books you get in the mail. And if you got the Cowboys, it'd be a leather-bound book, fake leather, right? Yeah. And, but I used, I used to get those. I used to get Leonardo and Michelangelo. I just, I was obsessed with Leonardo da Vinci. This is me in, at Knox College now. And after all that engineering, I became an art major, but I was a weird art major because I, it, uh, because I was drawing figures and I wanted to see everything through these eyes I had developed as a builder. I didn't know that. I couldn't say that, but I would I look at a nude body and I would, this is 1989. So I was basically drawing them as I understood them formally. Like I, I was like, why would I draw straight line? There's no straight lines on her. Look at her, right? So I was like trying to understand like a typographic map, you know? And I was dreaming back then about weird stuff like sci art and weird stuff. So why Leonardo? Leonardo is kind of like the grandfather of modern design. If you want to think about design, you think of Leonardo da Vinci. Because what he did was he really showed how the drawing process is the, is the connection between the imagination and, and, and realizing something anything it, it doesn't it, uh, and they had an argument in the renaissance it was the disegno esterno and disegno interno disegno esterno meant the, like we think today we think of photographs as being a perfect representation of reality right and a mannerist or a renaissance artist would say that's ridiculous that's just what your dumb eye sees the superficial of the world right but if you want to see with understanding, they went back to a platonic idea of the form within the truth of something. And the way you're going to find that out is you're going to cut it open. You're going to get a cadaver. You're going to look at muscles and stuff. So when Michelangelo's bodies look so real, it's because he knew every, he knew what was going under the skin. So his people had like a hyper realism, like a super reality to them. Okay. And that's because they really wanted to learn. So there was this debate about internal design, design and interno. And uh, so, but the, the fallout was, if you could design, if you could draw a human body, it's still a belief in lots of art. If you can draw a human body, everything else is easy. Like, 
having a wheel that has a like a uh, a bow and arrow machine gun that's just gravy that's the stuff you can do because you know how to draw you can visualize it okay we're going to talk today about visualizing and you, you certain aids you can use that you don't have to be a good drawer to actually draw pretty good okay so uh and he was obsessed with structure and that's where my obsession came in and this is a bridge done by Leonardo where most of the structure is coming in tension. Almost all of your structure in your body, or your strength is coming from tension, not compression. Lego is about brick art and compressive bodies, right? But you're a tensegrity structure. Most, almost, you, there's, what exercise do you do the most pushing in? Raise your hand if you think, you know, or what, what exercise is the most pushing done in? Squats. Squats? Yeah, right? Push-ups. Push-ups, right? It's a trick question. Our muscles can't push anything. Our bones and muscles together could have the illusion of pushing, but there's not a muscle in your body that actually pushes. It's like you're living, it's like your reality is actually marionette reality, but you're not conscious of the string. You're living in what you call a push-up reality. I push and I punch and I, and I jump, right? But, all, but that's all the result of all these things pulling all the time. Crazy reality. But I don't think they knew until they started cutting the body and saying, actually, what's going on? It's always going to just pull. They don't, don't think pushes. It's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. It's just levers and give you the idea to push, right? Why is that important? Well, okay. So, and then you got Leonardo famously did this bridge that they had actually constructed later on as a model so that it would work. It's a Y shaped bridge. And, uh, and then I'll end it with this. This was his famous army tank. Right. So I go to I say I meet this guy named Carlo in, in Galesburg. He's a he's a he's a resident artist there for one of the his residence program every summer. Carlo Vittori, whose real name, well, he was given that name. He was a Jewish guy from New Jersey called Charles Stanley. His dad was also his dad came from Poland and his name was Stanley Stanley. Because he changed his name with some incomprehensible last name. See, his dad is Stanley Stanley, a printer. He's Charles Stanley. He goes to Italy and all the kids say, Ciao, Carlo Vittori, Ch Charlie the Painter. So he changed his name to Carlo Vittori Euphorico, Charlie the Happy Painter. Okay, so I meet this guy. He's crazy. He's awesome. And he says, you've got to come live to me. He was like, he was like my Burgess Meredith to my Rocky. I was like Rocky Balboa. I was kind of, in, I, was, I was barely verbal. I was like, you know, just this 22 year old kid. Ugh. And he's like, you don't know how to speak. You don't know how to draw. You don't know how to paint. You need to live in the woods for you. Like Thoreau, get in the woods. You got to live. So I said, okay. So see that, right? So that's the tank, right? That's the tank, right? Guess where I lived? In a year. I moved in a Leonardo's tank. I was like, oh my God. So these are the yurts. These are the yurts made, made by an architect back in the 60s called Copperswick from Yale. And it was these experimental structures, okay? And I, this was my house right here. I painted the watercolor. There. That was my yurt. And, you, and I made the mistake of using these logs in my fire. Why would that be a mistake? That going to burn that thing. No, they're pine. Ooh. Oh. You don't use pine in, in the steel stove. Yeah, and they creosote, they burn fast, they burn and they, they cause a fire in your in your in your in your exhaust because they creosote, they're very oily. So, anyways, um, this was a yurt that was deserted. This is happens to a yurt when it, it dies. So the yurts were based on barrel construction. And if you've ever seen a wine barrel, they have those hoops that go around them, they're based on tension. So they're two cones inverted, but they, they rely on the tension of that cable. It's like a cable, like on a telephone pole cable. So obviously the roof cable, it just came undone from the roof and the roof just kind of caved in. Fortunately, there was nobody in there that I know of, okay? But so I was really intrigued by that. This whole beautiful structure was being held up really by that cable. The integrity, as Fuller would say, of the structure was really in the cable. It held the whole thing up. Without that cable, it just squashed down like origami flat, right? So I was like, so here I am complete, you know, have my engineering background, my art background. And I'm like, okay, I love this guy. I learned about him first studying about uh, Black Mountain College when I was at Knox. Black Mountain College was this interesting phenomenon. It wasn't really a college. It was like a summer kind of stock college. But all these great thinkers like Charles Ives and um, uh, just these great American 20th century thinkers went through there. And Fuller was like the least bohemian looking of them all. He wore a tie all the time. He talked in 10 syllable words. 
but he was trying to make his first geodesic dome, that's the geodesic dome, at Black Mountain College out of Venetian blind material, and they never would stand up. It always collapsed. But the kids were obsessed with making it work, and they finally did. Okay, so that's him at Black Mountain College. I was like, who the hell is he? I relate to him. You know, he's like really interesting, and I love his shapes. And uh, that's the one he made in Montreal at the, at the World Expo in Montreal. It burned. The skin famously burned off, but the structure stayed fine. And that's a very strong structure. And it's uh, he, he, he did well because he patented this thing, and the Army recognized his patent. And all the radomes for all the military installations all around the world that would detect like ICBMs and were all encapsulated in one of his domes. OK, so he when he was young, he was imagining making these 4D constructions all over the world um, based on tension. These are your tensile. Basically, you'd be a big mast and the whole all these decks be held up by tensile cables. Super lightweight. They can be delivered by dirigibles, he thought. All you do is blast some diamond to the ground, pour some concrete, make a post and then have these really lightweight structures. So he's obsessed with doing more with less. Uh, he called it ephemeralization or it's optimization. He'd say, see how heavy your house is? It's ridiculous. You're not getting any performance out of all that money. Okay. He went, he drove through Galesburg and in, in our area, saw these grain silos during the war and said, we ought to turn those grain silos into, um, into uh, um, habitats for our soldiers overseas. So in Japan and Alaska and all these places in the, in the, in the Philippines, they started putting up these, they, instead of Quonset huts, they started uh, basically refurbishing grain silos into um, structures, okay? Uh, there's, a, there's a marine helicopter flying one of his around. And then it's one of his later designs that he called this technology, again, changing, changing reality. You can change the language. I mean, people there trying to change the language all the time. He was changing language by saying, let's, let's differentiate in technology between living re and killing re. Okay? Killing re is the business, like Lockheed Martin, of making things that go boom, right? And we live off the fallout of that. So after World War II, we had these beautiful, shiny, stainless steel salad bowls that were the heads of torpedoes, right? We had the fallout of World War II. It was amazing for the baby boomers. They had all this gorgeous stuff. They didn't know where it came from, plastics. They made plastic domes for the, for the bombers, right? So he had the fall from more technology, killing ring. He said, why don't we intentionally make technology for living? He called it living ring, where you're intentionally setting out to, to do things for life and not just hoping that your fallout from your bombers could be sold, you know, this Luan or something for, you know, domestic use. So that was one of his things too. And this is one of his domes, it's a little... He, he basically said, he said also, the house is a machine with valves. You're valving in and out water and waste. And so see it as a machine. It already is a machine, just it's a crappy machine. The, the, your machine stinks. Why do you think, why, if you're thinking of a machine, why do you think of a good machine? Okay, and this is some of his stuff. So this was his obsession. It became my obsession. And then, so you saw it in the video of me. This is a, uh, an old paint warehouse in Chicago along the Bel um, Belmont and Rockwell uh, along the Chicago River. And I lived there. It was a painted floor, glass block windows. And I, I think we got it for $200 a month. It was like 3,000 square feet, you know, 20 foot ceilings. This is before they did the you know, renovations and stuff. So that, so you, you could always find cheap real estate. If you're willing to live a little bohemian, I had to use a, a paint sprayer to shower with. So it was kind of crude. You know, but I was, you know, 24. Who cares? You know, I was actually living with my girlfriend. She was cool with it. So and so I came up with my own idea. It's called the Y systems theory. So I wanted I was obsessed with trying to find out. I said, even if it's not true, I want to see how much you can reduce a construction system to how many parts you really need to make lots of things. So I was optimizing uh, parts. So I came down to this idea of a, a Y shape with, with, with a, a divergent angle of 135 degrees, which is called the Fibonacci angle. And I found that I can code it and I can just have an ABC code. And then these are the different ways that this algorithm goes together. I didn't use a computer for this, it's all hand drawn. And I was like, okay, and these also move, these actually fluctuate. So this is a little, a little game I played where I'd say, okay, if I follow ABC, ACB, ABC, It'll, it'll make a blastula, like when an egg forms, a, a, when, it, when, the, when the little zygotes form with the little split eggs inside the womb, and eventually it makes a sphere, and then it'll have a little uh, indentation, little dimple, and the dimple will go inside and form an inner endoderm, so an exoderm, endoderm, right? Your first organ, kind of, your inside of your body. Then it'll form little organelles after that. 
bloom, 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 bloom. And I was like, I could put that in the code. So I was like, and there were other scientists doing the same kind of thing. So it was like, I wasn't by myself. There were lots of scientists doing and, and programmers and chaos theory people doing this kind of stuff. So this was my obsession for about four or five years. Okay, and it's all this Y3 stuff. I designed buildings with it. This was supposed to be a St. Louis old man, old man in River Auditorium. We actually drove down in, a, in an open Jeep, St. East St. Louis to Chicago and work with Why Better Young, a local congresswoman, to see if the Disney would be interested because they were saying they were interested in developing East St. Louis. That never happened. So you dream. So this happened, this drawing happened right before Luxbox was invented. Okay, this is where I was going. I was like, this system will build everything. And then so here it is. This is how we think of design. Okay, this is like the process. Of course, you just saw I was in a process, a very internal process. It was my, I was the audience. I was, I was only interested in satisfying satisfy myself, right? I wasn't going to burden anybody else, though I did, but I didn't want to burden anybody else with my bullshit ideas until I felt very confident they could turn something. I never could figure out how to make the why into a toy or anything else practical, okay? So it, became, it was just like a private obsession. You guys ever have private obsessions? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this what it is. But when you get to design, you have, you, this is a social thing. You have to involve other people. If you want to make a product people are going to buy, it's wise to involve other people in that process, okay? So I was, uh, defi- I spent 20 years like defining a problem. Nobody else, the problem was, I had a problem nobody else seemed to have. That was another situation like, okay, I seem to be the only guy that's bothers Right. Like I, I'm really obsessed with this optimization problem. Nobody else seems to care about it. the heavy houses they live in or the toys they play with. So maybe I'm just on a dead end. Right. So this is the phase right here. I'm, I made this slide a lot of times in the presentation and uh, we will get to making things. So. Um, so in the meantime, I was a portrait painter and I also taught art. So that's what I did for a living. Not a great living, but my wife tolerated it. And um, so I painted portraits and we had a little art studio in our house, okay? And then uh, we, because we're who we are, we started a Boy Scout troop and then we started a Young Marine group. Then we had a maker space, Young Marines is a co-ed organization um, uh, just based in the Marine Corps. And the kids um, learn military manners and they learn uh, all these different skills and, uh, but in the garage, the young Marines had a maker space and we were inventing toys. And we had Legos and we had chemical kits and we had cut out pieces of, of plywood into triangles and squares. And we're, I, I'm, I'm basically insinuating on these kids my obsessions, right? I'm like, hey guys, you want to play with shapes? You know? <laughs> so uh, that's my son. Well, now he's like 22 or 21, but that's him back then. So um, then the idea came, Eureka, right? And uh, so, again, this is way after the fact. My wife and I talking, if we made this toy, who is our audience? It's, we call them aspirational parents, millennial moms, early adopters, which became a huge thing, actually. Nostalgia people, people who play with their toys like guys in their 40s and 50s and 60s, women who play with toys older on. And then um, child development people, okay? So there, these are little roadmaps we have. Who will be our potential audience? Adults. That's a thing, adults, right? More than ever, I think. Okay, and then we looked at the competition and uh, I know this guy is a hippie, zone tool, uh, and uh, it's a very interesting toy. It's not as much a toy as it is, it models zonohedra. He's a Bucky Fuller acolyte too, in a way. And there's magnetiles. We're actually the closest to magnetiles. Our blocks are closest to magnetiles. We have an active edge that connects, but it's not a magnet, okay? And it connects. Uh, and we looked at their strengths and weaknesses and how we fit within the whole uh, playing field of all our, our competition, okay? So you're seeing it like, okay, so you can see it's a very different process than living in a hut and, and thinking about, you know, why leaves look the way they do, you know? Back to this thing again, phase two, build up empathy. So I do, who do I give a shit about, okay? For us, it was that little kid at home who plays with Legos and it's like, okay, can this kid go beyond brick art? Because Legos is brick art. Brick art's been around since uh, like 7,000 years, 
right? And it really isn't much of a difference between a Babylonian um, sphinx made out of bricks and uh, Iron Man made out of uh, Lego, right? It's the same like, exact art form, okay? So like, well, we can, I think we can do that. They will appreciate what we have to offer. Okay, now you saw in the video, Froebel. Why, why talk about some guy who lived in the 1850s? Because something so important happened that no, most teachers know nothing about. It's really interesting how teachers don't know their own history. And I'm a big, if you've noticed, I'm a big believer in knowing the history of what you're up to do because it's the only one you got. You might as well know it, right? And the history of education's mind was blown with Maria Montessori, Pestalozzi, and then Froebel. Froebel was a scientist and he studied crystals, not California crystals, but like actual minerals. And he cataloged them, he drew them. And he said, if kids had blocks and, and different manipulatives that did this, this, the movements and the shapes of nature, okay? He believed this. Uh, he was a true progressive, not like a political progressive, but a true progressive. He believed that, uh, as an educator, he believed that the mind is not something you fill up, like just learn the shit I'm telling you, kid, you'll be fine. It was more like the mind is this potentiality. It's unknown, right? And it's a connecting making machine. And if you give them lots of opportunities to have these rich experiences, the best outcome is one you can't predict. The new Leonardo, the new Frank Lloyd Wright, the new Le Corbusier, the new Einstein. By the way, they all went to Fargo kindergartens. Le Corbusier, the French guy, um, Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright played with the verbal blocks. This is, this is a typical verbal block construction. Frank Lloyd Wright credited uh, his, his years in kindergarten as being his launching pad. Okay, for Le Corbusier also was hugely affected by, he made his whole shape system. And if you look at the shape system the Freud kids were playing with, it's like stunning how close it was. The Bauhaus movement in Germany, before in Weimar, Germany, before uh, Hitler, there was this movement called Bauhaus. Uh, 20th century design is pretty much based on Bauhaus. It was like the foundations of 20th century design, of good quality design. And they said it was the Freud kindergarten. Piet Mondor on the painter, Freud, uh, all these... Uh, Paul Klee. So we started to beat our drum. We're going to do more with less. We're going to maximize the opportunity for kids to, to imitate nature. Okay. All these things in terms of marketing kind of don't work. They're kind of, they're kind of intellectual, but it didn't matter because we knew what we thought we knew what we were doing. And we said, okay, if people aren't used to building something that imitates nature, there's no use telling them how much, how cool it is. Make it, let them play with it, and I'll tell you how cool it is, okay? Because it's like, why would you argue with them, right? Mm -hmm. So once we start giving it to kids, now you're getting into the phase where you're getting proof of concept. Kids are playing with it. I'm getting photographs from, like, here in Vancouver. A teacher sends me pictures of the kids, what they're doing with it. That became, like, our icon picture. That became, that girl was, like, she was everything. I love her. And um, so uh, we started building big stuff with it. People would come over and want to take pictures with their stuff. So it got, it got popular. And uh, this is a Russian, Russian engineer who said, please send me someone to play with it. He was making robotic arms, different, different things with it. So this is just things that are happening on the side. We're not making money with this stuff, but I'm sending shit all over the world because people want to play with it. I'll send you stuff. Just take pictures, right? Because you're trying to prove the concept. You're trying to see what will other people make of your obsession. It's not going. Let's see. Oh, I got a. How to go past this? Oh, there it is. So these are kids in Indiana. They made the biggest fidget flexor ever. So the fidget flexors. This is something we didn't anticipate. So we're not, we're in the world of linkage. You're a linkage system. This is a linkage system. Okay. This is a linkage. Okay. This imitates like a ballerina's pier, uh, plie, right? Okay, some kid named Gerard, we knew you could make these bigger and fatter, but Gerard uh, Remus, who was 12, made the first uh, pocketed modular fidget flexor. Okay, and these kids made the biggest one ever. He, they made one stage bigger than that, and there was so much friction they couldn't pull it apart. Okay, but they keep, they, they, so it's interesting because what is it? We first called it a flux, then we called it a capillarion, and now we call them flexors. Right? Mm -hmm. Which I didn't realize is also what kids call people who show off. Oops. <laughs> didn't know that. I'm old. Don't know. Again, back to this. So now we're getting into 
I never saw this chart when I did any of this stuff. I saw this chart like last week. Honestly, God, when we saw do I'll do a design presentation. I said, I better look what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's good. That makes we kind of did that backwards. Yeah. So again, prototyping. We use 3D printers, okay? This was one of the last stages. We got, we did the trigons, which is a little triangular sheets right here. We did these trigons in the wheels because Target said we want to have in our stores, but we only have squares at the time. They said, so we want to have you have cars. So we had to invent a wheel. Well, we had to invent the wheel. So <laughs> I said, the wheel has, I said, if we're going to invent a lux wheel, it's got to do a couple of things. So it meshes like a gear and it also works as a pulley. Okay, so it was well multi wheels, and then I snuck in because I had to sneak these in. I said we should do triangles too. So I snuck in a couple molds: the axle mold, the, the wheel mold, and this mold. Okay, a mold is like buying a, a used SUV to a small used house. It depends on how big the mold is. Molds are very expensive. The big capitalization is the mold. Okay, but you make a lot of money with the mold, so it's worth it. Okay, so that was the trigon mold. Okay, and then you saw, you saw in the video, relying on friends and family. We, we had a little bit of friends and family investment, not very much, about 125, but we had tons of family and friends who came out to help us. Our first factory was in, a, in an outbuilding in Cameron, Illinois for the first year. And uh, it was like a party. They were paid in toys and pizza. It was pretty cool. So, and they were awesome. And then Bridgeway took over. Bridge, you know Bridgeway? You all know Bridgeway? Bridgeway is not a church. Bridgeway is, there's an organization here like it too, like uh, Peoria Production. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, same thing. People with, with um, mental disabilities. Yeah. And, um, and so they were great at this. They, were, they ended up being too expensive for us in the long run. We, we figured out we could probably do it ourselves, but it took us a couple of years to figure that out. Because really it's an investment. We got a building across the street from our house. Our patent came through. Uh, we had two patents. Um, and that was very exciting. It's exciting. The patents are beautiful. They really make do They put gold leaf on the cover. It's really, patents are cool, but they fought us. And they, be prepared to be fought by the, the clerk. The clerks will fight you. They'll say that. And then the biggest thing they'll say is that's obvious art, right? And you guys say, Ziegler, was, Ziegler did this and Hashimoto did that. No, no, there's, there are Hashimoto's. You, are you Hashimoto? Yeah, yeah there, there's an inventor of Hashimoto. Couple. So, um, so there's usually it's like it was, was the Germans and Japanese, and they and like you guys say, okay, you quote. It's like law. You have to quote the the, the patents and say they went to here and they and Ziegler went to here, but neither one of them is an obvious leap to us. And we want I had to make exhibit A, exhibit B. Oh my god! So that was quite a process too. So, and then it's like, then you get, then you get people recognizing you. In, in 2019, we were the grand prize winners at the FedEx Small Business Challenge, which was awesome. My wife told me I almost fainted. I thought she was lying to me. She goes, you got to come home real quick. I can tell you. Then she told me and I was like, you're so full of shit. I yelled at her, right? And, and she goes, no, we're the grand prize winner. It's $50,000 and we're going to Memphis and getting, you know, it was awesome. So it's like playing Monopoly. And when we got there, I thought we didn't deserve this. These first people here are so much better than we are, right? But it's like playing Monopoly. You win community chess, five move five forwards, you're on Marvin Gardens. It's just like that, you know? You just hope it's more positive than negative. So, um, and then again, Getting the feedback from so many people send you photographs. My kids love these. He's asking for more of this color. Could you do that? A teacher in, um, in, in um, Oregon, in Salem, Oregon, was making all these mathematical models, right? And she started working for us, actually. And so um, these crazy things happen. Again, so, uh, and you saw this. This is, um, so can I press play? How do I press play on this? Uh, so what you're looking at now is uh, second stage of our so development of this. We're now the chair is made it so the full guy could it's very hard around. It's, it's very hard for us around. because Minecraft yeah, is like Lego. Be it's the XYZ axis. The computers love the XYZ axis. They can do all day long. They don't like if it's one part. degree of temperature. And now but when you do you this, hover over the lunch box on the computer, and once, the you, engine, once you touch it, makes, it keeps up the room. Mouse towards it's just it. too much calculation. You know once it lights up, you it's a lot of calculating. So we're actually pushing the edge the of AI. 
with modeling our stuff. So the next thing will be sort of um, we're in the physics of interactivity. But they float around real pretty. So here we go. <laughs> so, anyways. And then this. This is what I need to I ended up using them. Again, back to this, and uh, yeah, and and you know, where are we going with the future kids? Kind of a silly slide, but I put it in there. Um, okay, now we're going to get into. Hey, well, first we'll start. Any questions? Can you talk a lot. Need water. <laughs> wow, any questions? Millions of them so far. Um, so the name Lux Box. It means light in Latin. Okay. And when we we homeschool our kids for a while, and I was a Latin teacher, and we started this whole thing called call the Project Lux. Before it was a toy. It was actually a drawing project. But we're going to talk about right now. And we uh, everything we did was like it's part of Project Lux, right? And then the toy became part of Project Lux. And I said, okay, guys, we got to think about a name for it. We call it all these different names and stuff, Astro, whatever, blah. And the kids like, we kind of like Lux. I'm like really like yeah call it lux block or something so that's how it came about lux it means yeah so it means light so you you talked about previously i don't think tonight but uh this you're originally creating these and and jumping into the toy market and discover that it wasn't really the toy market that you were gonna you were gonna find the most success it was education yeah well here okay we can talk about that my wife's like, don't get too much into the weeds of business because it's a design class. <laughs> okay, honey, okay. But here's the deal. And you guys know this being in your field, right? You, you, you have an idea, you want to do a business, but when you do that, it's like you, you find the, your, the love of your life and you marry them, right? And then you find out, oh, shit, she's got a family. Oh, God. <laughs> is it really that close to Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> and that's what business is like. You don't pick your family, right? You don't pick your wife's family. And so we, we uh, and I don't hate anybody, okay? Don't get me wrong. But when we got into the toy world and went to these conventions and things, I'm like, oh, I should go here, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. We found out that the toy world was very much about commodity. 99% of toys were in China, where we we're, were dogging about making it in America. And um, there was, uh, I'll give you an example. One guy came up to me, probably in his late 60s, early 70s, maybe older. He said, I remember when I got the account for Rock'em Sock'em Robot and Woolworths. I was like, holy shit. I felt so young. And I'm not that young, but I felt like, oh, my God. You know? And, I, I, you know, and that was the toy industry, right? It was, it was about a whole hierarchy of middle people. And it's not the difference from any other industry. If you're nuts and bolts, you just can't have a factory and sell it to the consumer necessarily until now. But, but then you didn't. You had to go through three or four or five different distribution channels before the customer got to see you on a shelf, right? And they were like, this sucks. It, you know, it was not fun. And then you have to, and we were dealing strictly with, with small retail and dealing with small retail who say they love toys, right? And you've got to really, um, uh, kind of warm them up to it and give them some free stuff and give them some signage. And you might get one or two purchases and that's it. Cause they want something. To, we said it like, they like glitter, glittery poop, <laughs> whatever is popular. And it could be, and there was glittery poop, by the way, that was the thing, but they want what's popular and trending that you can see on TV. And that that's not our strength. We're not, we couldn't afford advertising TV. We weren't part of that thing. And Lego almost went on a business till so they, they jumped on the channel of, um, of uh, licensing, right? So Lego, uh, they had the perfect storm. Kids were still reading books, or not anymore, but they were. And they had read the Harry Potter series. They made the movies and they made the Lego Harry Potter and they killed, right? So, and then so Lego married Disney. Now that they're Disney and all the Disney franchise. Whatever. So that's how they survived. We couldn't, we couldn't go that way. Okay. 
And that world is changing too, because YouTube now is killing movies. Mm -hmm. So everything, even for Lego, the ground is, and we were at a trade show. I told these guys a story in 2017, I think at the New York, the New York toy fair. And a, a rumor went around that it was so chilling to people. And it was, and we just got into Target, by the way. And, and the, the rumor went around that, that Toys R Us uh, did not pay a bill. That was like an earthquake because Toys R Us was the store all the big guys wanted to get into, right? And we just got into Target. And what that did was, I'll imagine like a, a armada of, of container ships coming from China and they're told mid course, destination unknown, right? So whoever the buyers in America who have to be target, they had to pick in the litter. All, and it's all licensed merchandise, Marvel, DC, Harry Potter, whatever, right? And they, they had to eat a home, my kitty, shark baby, whatever it is, right? They had to, <laughs> get to go somewhere and Target was like any brand that didn't have that kind of thing was out. So we're like, so we, that's when we did our major pivot back to where our, you saw my heart, my heart's in education, my heart's in like, you know, kind of an innovative toy, not a consumer kind of, um, not a consumer, but commodity product, right? So we went hard in education. And then we, then we started romancing the big houses like Fisher Scientific, NASCO, Dick Blick, all the people who supply the schools. And that became a, a much more stable train for us because throughout the year, the orders are always steady. So when you start a business, you're marrying an infrastructure, okay? And it's any kind of, it doesn't matter if it's a toy, anything. You're marrying, and you're like, you have to question the assumption. We, our assumption was people buy toys in toy stores, like in the movies, <laughs> right? And that was a stupid assumption. That actually was a very descendant trend, right? And the people who said they're, we're independent small retailers. We believe in the, the child. We believe in small retail. In the back room, they've got the girl, the high school girl out front by the cash register. And in the back room, they're selling their stuff on Amazon. So you're, you're romancing them and wanting and dying them, trying to get the body. And they're, they're out there outbidding you on Amazon. So we got, we got a little bitter about it. Like, you know, we can sell on Amazon too. So... Yeah, so it's dealing with Amazon and all the different e market, all the market platforms. And um, yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you marry an industry and then you got to deal with like, uh, do we want to play this game or could we, could we make our own rules up and still survive? And the giants fell. After that happened, Connects, they didn't go into bankruptcy. PNC, they just didn't pay their loan at PNC Bank, and PNC just put them up for auction. And that was our number one competitor was, it was Connex. It was a, you know, there's a blue sky brand. They didn't want to do it anymore. And you know, the funny thing is, they're still making it for the people who bought it. The guy, he separated his factory from his company, which is so smart, right? He was a plastic manufacturer who was at a wedding with his brother. And they came up with it on a napkin because they wanted to keep their molds going. So anyways, that's a little weird. That's dirty inside of baseball. <laughs> so, in the, uh, any more questions? So, we use the 3D printer a lot, by the way. We had a MakerBox 2X, MakerBox 2X. And if you knew about MakerBox 2Xs, they, the original CEO guy, they're like, this is for the MacGyvers. This is the people who really want to tear into something. You're not afraid of mistake. And, uh, oh, my God, I took that thing apart so many times. I was in their customer service so often. It's like, oh, yeah, you just fried the board. I'll send you another board. Oops. You know, because it was a big, beautiful machine that sometimes worked. And if it worked, it made the coolest sounds. But and we put 4,000 hours on that machine. We made thousands of blocks. And it was nuts. It was just nuts. But um, so, and we made different, we, they, we had a boy named Daniel, a German immigrant, who lived across the street, 15 years old. We volunteered for the FRC challenge, the robotics challenge. And one of the things in the team was if a kid could learn AutoCAD and model the, ro the robot in AutoCAD, the team got points. Well, Daniel was German, so he learned AutoCAD and modeled the robot because he's German. And I mean, he was, these were prototypical little German kids. And um, they were just amazing. So I said, Heather, I know how to draw pretty much. And I could draw the ideas, and Daniel could make an a, a AutoCAD drawing. And the, the benefit of AutoCAD is 
printers read AutoCAD. And we can, we pay a few people to print them for ourselves, horrible. See, we were at the perfect time because before the 19, in the 1990s and before, you had to pay people to prototype your stuff, right? Because the printers were just too expensive, but they came down to be like $5,000 range. So we, we paid people a couple of times to prototype ourselves for a few hundred bucks. You'd wait like weeks and weeks to get the part back in two seconds, you didn't work. We finally bought a printer. We were making two or three iterations a day where I change the design, give it to Daniel, he'd make a new design, we print it, nope, do it again. So it became rapid prototype. Rap and that's kind of what you want. You want you want to make just so many mistakes. You know, uh, they talk about Elon Musk all the time. That's his secret. His secret is they blow shit up. They're, they want it. It's like Edison. They want the mistakes, not because they're crazy, but because the mistakes teach. Right, and they and they know what their goal is. Their goal is to get a rocket into space that carries as least amount of fuel as possible and the most payload as possible. That's to push through a heavy atmosphere and a, and a heavy gravity. It's the hardest problem. So he hired people like people who make water towers and grain silos. People who are used to working with sheet metal, and they use this principle. That's one of the principles of Lex So it's, that's where I was harping on. Lego stacks, right? We we uh, we bend. Now, what's the benefit of that? Well, if you see a grain silo, or if you see an airplane, you see a rocket, the metal is bent. So, why does it bend now? Right. Mm -hmm. This doesn't seem to predict this, but any engineer will tell you that. You don't use beams that are just flat pieces of metal. You, you change them into shapes like I's and T's and L's, right? And you don't see grain silos that have smooth walls. They have that waffle pattern going up because it becomes rigid. It's called corrugation, which is kind of a trade term, but it's actually a scientific concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you look at variegated leaves. It's in nature all the time. Bones, you instead of bones, cells. So this is a principle. And kids are playing with, they don't have to know they're playing with the principal. We used to call Lux Blocks the principal block because there's these principles they're playing with. I don't know why we dropped that. I always like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then other principles like this. Like, this, this we, didn't know, we didn't know it would do this, right? This, they call this like a goon bowl. Um, uh, in California, you want the architects want buildings to do this. Why is that? More earthquakes than wind. Yeah, you want your building to kind of adjust to the ground vibration, right? So the, the buildings will move. This is what a cube or a prism, this is what they want to do, right? We stabilize everything and think that now it's what it, that's what it, now what it wants to do is 9 11 when those buildings came down, that beautiful organic shape. That's what they always wanted to do. They finally get to do it. it sounds horrible, horrible in the States will say that, but it is beautiful to see things, the Hindenburg things blowing up and stuff. It's made, you, you, you can't kick nature and it's not going to say I don't know what to do about that. It's going to do something really interesting about that. It always responds. It usually responds in a really organic, natural way, right? But this is very cool. It was an unintended consequence, and there were tons of unintended consequences. We, another thing is when you design something, it's going to do things that you won't understand, right? People are going to have responses to it that you didn't predict. Good and bad. So you're always learning from it. We invented it, then we didn't know how to explain it. Like, oh shit, I don't really know how to explain this. <laughs> so we, you know, we had to learn our product. It sounds like a weird thing, like you think you'd have the idea first. And you see with software, a lot of times it's, I have a clever pitch for Y Combinator. I had this perfect, and I understand my product perfectly, but it's not real yet, right? We did the exact opposite. We had the product, but we couldn't pitch it, right? So. I don't know what's learned from that, except um, we weren't thinking about the end customer at first. We we're, were thinking about me at first, me as the end customer, and then a small group, and then a bigger and bigger group. And that's how so, I honed it down. So it's very, very similar to you know, going back to software company. Um, if software companies discovered, you know, hey, if we make our if we make our our game engine open source and Put it out to the users what happens with it. it's very similar to this it's essentially it's an open source physical product yeah and that's how when we go with electronics where it's going to be purely open source mm -hmm. one of the one of the ideas 
not patenting this, but um, is the idea is we like off the shelf. Mm -hmm. You know, we like off the shelf stuff. We want people to hack into it and play with it and own it because they own it then, right? And that was a big debate with Apple and IBM, right? You have the open source architecture box or you have a closed system that nobody can tamper with. Mm -hmm. Both were right, which is weird. I mean, you know, Apple, you, people don't hack into Apple's. They don't, oh, maybe you guys do. But most people, you can't really get into an Apple, right? But PCs, that's what they are. There's a shell, you open it up and stick things in. Yeah, to answer your question? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we're all for open architecture. Awesome. So you, you said how you had a product, but you kind of didn't have a customer. So you had something you were wanting to sell, but um, you talked about kind of your experience and what you learned from all that. What would you advise other people to do or other entrepreneurs to do based on your life experience, your business experience? Well, you're not going to be me. Who could be? No. <laughs> Obviously, I came from a very weird set of circumstances. And I, and I only did this backwards. I looked back at my life and said, oh, geez, my dad built every home on my block. That's a coincidence. You know, maybe that had something to do with me being obsessed with building. You know, maybe. Maybe it's not. But I just think it's interesting. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think you have to look at – you're, you know, I'm not going to say every person's precious and special, but the kind of are in the sense that you own your own experiences. So own them. And if you want to uh, be able to design, design things, I'd say start with designing on the cheap. Drawing is the cheapest way to design besides like clay and things like that. Uh, and and uh, imagine, uh, do lots of drawings and, and play with it. I did that a lot. I, I would draw toys and I never created. Just say, well, that, I try to imagine, like the Y theory. I try to imagine what it would make. I built very few models because it was really hard to build. I had the origami uh, Ys and glue these things together. It took forever, right? But I pursued that kind of crazy rabbit hole for a long time. You know, so you're going to find a rabbit hole. It'll look like a rabbit hole to other people. Like, oh, he's like, he's into this shells. I don't know. Joe's in the shells. I don't know. Pretty soon, Joe's got shells and towels and they're selling on the beach. You know, his shell obsession actually is like going viral, right? But it's probably started as like a weird obsession of yours, right? And I think now it's different. I didn't have chat groups. I didn't have like gaming friends. I, didn't, I was off. I didn't have, I lived in a hut in the woods. The only electricity I had was from my little FM radio and I only got NPR. So I was in the Garrison Keeler and holy crap and classical music. It's all I had in the woods, there was no electricity, right? Which I think was really good for me, right? But now people have these gaming communities and these little online and, and uh, um, not Substack. What's the one people go to and ask questions? Reddit, Reddit, Reddit communities, so stubborn. So it's a different world and people could communicate more than they could when I was young. And, and I found out one of our marketing strategies early on was I got into these Facebook niche groups, it's like geeky, geeky niche groups like geometry and math or math and art, right? And I started just putting up videos and what I'm doing and stuff. And then I hardly ever got rejected. I was like, it was kind of an advertisement, but I didn't say it was an advertisement, right? And I, I got buzz in like conferences and stuff. And so I got known by professors and things like that. So you can go up to different, I go up to the higher brain function of society. You, you'd be like tapping. They're very small in groups. They're easy to access. So yeah, so that's like guerrilla marketing. You're trying to get early adapters. Adapters or adopters? Adopters, right? Yeah. So you have a lot of the different entrepreneurs at different stages of the, the, their journey and experience and process. So some people have a great idea, but that's all they have. Some people have ideas uh, and customers. Some people have ideas, no customers. Can you kind of talk through? Yeah, don't ask your family. And probably don't even ask your friends. Because, you know, they're always going to say the wrong thing and they're trying to be nice. They don't want to hurt your feelings. Your feelings need to be hurt, right? Uh, there's a thing in art called preciousness. And early art, when you go to art class and people, because they can't, they don't, they have so little faith in their ability. When they make something halfway decent, they want to make an, a, 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 like a temple around it, right? And that's called preciousness. 
they should burn it. The great Japanese potters were known for destroying their work. They just smash them against the wall because they're trying to make the perfect, you know, Buddhist teacup or whatever they're trying to go for. It was like a, they were going for this idea and they knew because they had their own standard that set, not just Japanese, Korean too, but it was like an Eastern thing where they would break a lot of their stuff because it was about the, the this idea they were going for, right? But that can relate to anything. Drawing is nice because you can make thousands of drawings before you go to the painting. Uh, Italians did that a lot. They'd make lots and lots of drawings. You see all the, the times, they, the early drawings, they have a leg, uh, outline of a leg, then another outline of a leg, then another outline of a leg, trying to get to that right line, right? Thank God we saved them. Most of them burned their drawings. Michelangelo burned like his bonfires, the drawings he burned because he wanted the reputation of being Michelangelo, like an archangel. He wanted to be, he was like one of the first great branded arts. He actually signed the Virgin Mary, which was like considered really kind of odd. But you know, Michelangelo on Mary's like thigh or something. He was like, dude, <laughs> mother of God. <laughs> Because they thought they thought that artists were close to God, that they were like tapping into something very important. They, but he was a brander. He was a, he was a like, Michelangelo brand was important. Yeah. So somebody that has a product does not have customers. What what kind of experience or advice could you? Do they have a product? Did the tree make a sound? <laughs> yeah. Like Joe Rogan says, uh, the, the comedy writers they go, how do they know they're funny? As opposed to people who are actually in the, in the clubs, they know they're funny or not because they have immediate feedback from the audience. Comedy is a good example of that. Comedy is a great example of the customers you want to test because they, they don't like you. You got to make them like you. They're perfect. So who's the ruthless person who's going to tell you what they think? You don't have to believe them, but you get a you get an assortment of them and you get a curve going on. Like, yeah, 99% of people think my idea sucks. Uh-oh. But then you could ask them, well, what would make it better, right? But you have to, uh, with um, Ross over there, where they had us do it at, at, uh, at the um, Grave Launch, yeah. uh, they had us call people, and I called teachers. And I said, teachers already bought our product and said, what would make it better? Teachers that haven't bought our product say, what do you need? You know? And what we learned from that was teachers don't know as much as you think they do. They thought they knew anything. And uh, they really want their hand held. And they only want something that's going to make their job easier. Right? And, they want, and they'd love to have something that the kids love. So that was what I most of them. It's like, you got to really make, you got to really, especially get to breach the school walls, which are really high. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we, and we did that. That was like five years into our company when we did that. But, um, yeah, at trade shows, you learn real fast. If you're at a trade show, you learn real fast. Those people don't care about you at all. They want to know if it's going to sell. Mm -hmm. So trade, and a lot of people go to trade shows before they have a product. So it's not stupid to go to a trade show. Like go to a printer trade show, a printer trade show. Maybe you have a printer idea. Go to the, the trade show. Look how people are selling their stuff. Maybe there's somebody you need to know. You say, what do you think about a printer that um, anticipates the next design? And they'll say, man, if you could do that, Right. Or they say, yeah, somebody's doing that over there. Going right away, right? You want to see a good movie about innovation, a, a good show? Uh, I don't usually recommend Netflix shows, but Halt and Catch Fire, it's like a sleeper show that killed. It was all about the Halt and Catch Fire. It was all about, it was, it was a fictional account of the whole revolution of computers in the 80s and 90s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's, it's terrific. But it talks about the first trade they go to and stuff. It's great. But it, it's a, a lot about tech, about hardware tech. But um, yeah. But yeah, so you want to have a, a disinterested person looking at your, hearing your idea. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Disinterested. And your family won't do it, especially like your mom. Oh, my God. Better not even tell her about it. Yeah. You know, just shortens her life. <laughs> you know. Tell her about it when you have an idea and you need a little money, maybe, but otherwise don't tell her. Yeah. And I didn't, I told, I didn't tell my dad much. He, he wasn't allowed to see this, but my dad was born in 1919. That's another, that's another advantage you might have. You have an older parent. I always consider that a huge advantage because I had a parent who was born in 1919. 
So my normal was like listening to Harry James on the radio. You know, my dad wasn't a baby boomer. You know, I'm like, I'm like two generations separate from my dad, which gave me an odd outlook on life. It, it's this, hey, something else might be, you might be an orphan. You, whatever, your, whatever your background is, it might be an advantage for you. Living in the hot in the woods, I'd recommend to anybody without electronics. Oh my God, that was huge for me. Because you have to deal with yourself. And I, I had read Thoreau on Walden Pond, so I was a little prepared for it. Though I heard he like went to his mom's tea every night. So I think that's a little <laughs> bit of propaganda. But what I raised three goats, three Nubian goats, um, which are interesting goats because they scream like murdered children. They're the most horrible scream you ever can imagine. How do you deal with murdered children scream? <laughs> <laughs> Have Nubian goats. <laughs> you could say that's probably as bad as it gets. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was fun living in the woods, hauling your own water, cutting your own wood. It's good for you. And you have to get you have to, you have to deal with yourself in, in isolation a little bit. It can be very healthy. And then, then I went to a range hall and went to a, a line dance in Bodenham, Maine, where it's all wood floors like this and people playing mandolins and stuff. And I was like, it was like, I would, probably two years before that, I would have thought like, oh, it's lame kind of country hick stuff. I was like so yearning for humanity that I loved it. Oh my God, it's great. So like I met my girlfriend there. But yeah, so yeah, put, throw yourself into really hard situations. It's, that's always good. And, and talk to people who will give you the, the, the hard truth. Yeah. yeah. So that's really good. General advice, probably. Is there anything in particular? Maybe that's even geared toward like you know, home students. Anything? Different or yeah, don't be a herd animal. Herd animals don't get anything done. Okay. Describe that a little bit more, maybe for people that don't know what herd animals really are. Don't know what a herd animal is. Well, I mean, uh, don't. There's a big belief right now in the pack, especially with the social media. I think it's that's why so many girls are killing themselves because they believe in this artificial reality where people are taking pictures of themselves and manipulating themselves, looking artificially beautiful. And kids could bully each other more than 24 hours, 24 seven. And so it's a horrible situation for a lot of girls, especially. They're like, they're killing themselves like a huge rate right now. Um, so I think that um, uh, when, we, when I was a kid, it's like, you're, you're ugly and everyone thinks so, mm -hmm. which is like a crappy thing to say, right? But now like I, I have, a, it's trending, mm -hmm. right? Like, and so it's really harsh. So um, I think that the herd is almost always wrong. The, the, the mass perception of people are always, almost always wrong. And I think a lot of it's fake anyways. You know, it's a lot of it's fake. So like, you should get opinions from people. I'm kind of sounding like I'm contradicting myself. But um, you, you have to be like an Elon Musk. You have to be an individual who's not afraid to stand on principles. Not to be a, a weirdo. Not to be a weirdo, but... Now being different just because you're weird, be different because you're standing on principle, right? On a, an established idea, you really worked it out. It might sound weird, like asking people how heavy their buildings are, you know, it sounds strange, but there was a reason why he was asking that, right? But why are rockets expensive? Sounds like a crazy question. Of course they're expensive, they're freaking rockets. He goes, but the metal that makes the rocket on the, uh, the London Exchange is actually very cheap to make a rocket. The metal doesn't cost much of anything. So why are they expensive? Because that's how much they cost. That's not an answer though, is it? Sometimes the answer to questions aren't really answers. They're herd response. See the difference? Herd response is just knee-jerk response. Well, you live in a house. Everyone lives in houses. What about a trailer? Poor people live in trailers. Well, if you're poor, though, then you can spend your money when you want to spend it on. But you're poor. People will see you as poor. Will think you're poor. Yeah, but what do I give a shit? You know what I mean? Like, there are sometimes you have to not care. Like, people thought I was crazy to live in the forest. Oh my God. That my parents didn't like that decision to live in the forest. They thought that was a stupid decision. But for me, it was like, I'll never say it was a bad decision. At the time, I wasn't sure. But yeah, nature rocks. And how long did you live out? Two years. Two years. It wasn't that long. But you know, uh, some people join the SEALs. 
Some people do marathons. People do things to challenge themselves for different reasons, right? That was like my marathon thing or my SEAL thing. I was a military guy, but uh, it was hard for me, you know? So whatever you, you think you need to do, you know, that's my advice. Putting yourself in challenging situations, getting yourself out of the norm, out of the herd mentality, out of the herd yeah, life. I, I, yeah, I think it's questioning, writing down all your assumptions. Yeah. What Fuller did was, Bucky Fuller, um, Buckminster Fuller said, he, he called himself Gene Digby. He locked himself in a room. It's kind of an, like one of those uh, stories, apocryphal stories, it's maybe true, maybe not. But he said he locked himself in a room for like a year and kind of taught, him, taught himself a whole new language to speak. He didn't want to say anything that was based on secondhand opinions right, or assumptions that weren't tested. And he came out with this incredible language. It was almost, uh, you know, impossible to understand. But he spoke very clearly. If you read his book, after the third reading, you kind of understand what he's saying. It was very, but it's very interesting. He would fill lecture halls, and he, he did eight-hour lectures in the 60s. He became like a guru in the 60s. People would invite him up to colleges all over the country, all over the world. But, um, but he invented this way of thinking that was based on Einstein. He said, if I live in Einstein's universe, I choose to look at the world this way. We're all based on frequencies and wavelengths. There are no things, there are no particles. It's just uh, interference patterns, like in Star Trek, like when you have a, a defense shield around your ship. And because what's the difference, if, if this is 99.99 at about 1,009 empty space, why are, you, why are you assuming this is a thing? And now Silicon Valley would be like, exactly, that's what we're trying to make transporters. Because, there is, because physical reality is an illusion. And you can prove it. Like, I can make radio waves go right through things, x-rays go right through things. Why are the x-rays going through? Well, because x-rays are x-rays and a hand is a hand. Actually, your hand is pretty much hollow space too. The distance between an electron and a proton is the same relative distance between the moon and the sun. That's how much empty space is going on. So it's crazy. It's like life is stranger than fiction or life is but a dream kind of thing, you know? And that's when you live at that edge of science where you're like, okay, if that's true, then maybe almost all of us are 99.9% full of shit and only spouting opinions that we heard from the people. If that's the case, my advantage is I know that. So you're already ahead because you know we're all full of shit, <laughs> right? So then you try not to be and try to look at something like, what if we made a yearbook a thing on, on, on the internet where people could constantly put up pictures and keep it going, like the Facebook, right? That's a stupid idea. That's way of yearbooks. You probably get a lot in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody would be interested in that. Who cares what she looks like now, right? Who cares what she looks like? So, so I know we've got some toy, uh, some things in, yeah. ahead of us to build, but before we do that, any other questions before we move into the active point? Yeah. Hands on. Yeah. How, how do you do the oh. <laughs> I don't like rejection. I don't, I have a, you know, some people have a thicker skin for rejection. I'm a Gemini. I don't believe in any shit. My wife does so. But Geminis, they say, have a, have a healthy uh, reaction to rejection. Because I, what my reaction is, I, um, I was not a popular kid. And I think it helped me out. Because since I wasn't a popular kid, I never really had any hope of being popular. I lost all hope. Because kids were so mean. And I was probably an asshole too. So I lost all hope in that. I didn't become Ted Kaczynski and want to be a Unabomber. I didn't go that route. I'm not crazy that way. But I just kind of didn't buy into it. The popularity thing, the hair, hair. I moved from Hillside, Illinois, where I showed you where I was Hillside, Illinois, to Barrington, Illinois. Because my parents finally moved because they were too wealthy for a block. So we moved to Barrington. We were the poorest people on our block. Our next door neighbor was Sam Filippo and son, who owned Iman's Nuts, the biggest nut distributor in the country. So, I mean, they're like the kings and queens of Yale, of Barrington. So uh, we weren't bad off, but I was around people who were much richer than me. But uh, so I went to school and I, we were into the Fonz and stuff in, in Hillside. And we had an Italian, all my friends were Italian, Polish and Irish. 
And I go to school and I have my hair greased back. I had pants on with, with shoes with leather bottoms. I couldn't even walk up the, the ramp. I was sliding. And people looked at me like, they called me the glare. I looked, I was like, what the hell is that? They all had like blow dryer hair and preppy shirts, like polo, things like that. I never heard of it, right? So I was like, instantly low man at a total ball, total dork, and uh, never got much better. So I think, again, it's the herd. I never felt like I was welcome in the herd. So I was like on my own, I was the artist guy. I always, my, my advantage was I always drew. So I was obsessed with drawing. So I wanted to be the best drawer in the class. So if I could be the best drawer, the best artist in the class, I was good with that. Like they could all go piss off, I don't care. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Great. Yeah. Uh, it helped you to keep going. Like yeah. Not to give up. Yeah. And I did, I did things that were, I was bad at that I would never get good at. Like my dad made me play sports because I didn't play sports. I had to go get a job. So it was a good deal. So I was in football, for instance. I was a terrible football player. But I played all through high school. I played. I weightlifted. I enjoyed weightlifting. I liked the weightlifting, like the hitting. But I didn't care if we won. I didn't care. Guys would be crying after losing a game. They'd be like, yeah, I just can't wait to go on my date. <laughs> I don't care. I, I mean, I wasn't that blatant about it. But I really, deep down, I knew that I was an imposter. It's like, in life, you know. There are certain situations where you know that everyone is, like, geeking out or something. And you know that you're, you're kind of pretending like you're geeking out. But you know you're an imposter. Like, this isn't my tribe. So, and I never did find my tribe, actually. I mean, I, I got close tribes. So I'm kind of the Clint Eastwood guy, like the High Plains Drifter guy. I'm comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I'll go into situations as long as I'm here. But I'm marrying our kids. Who I'm fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> but you, I think you find your wife, and that's your tribe, your family's your tribe, right? Mm -hmm. But everything else, like, like I went to a rotary meeting last week, and, I, and it was great. I loved it. And of course, they came and he goes, you know, we're looking for numbers. I'm like, you know what? Talk to Bill, and he's my guy. And if I decide to do it, Bill will know. Walk out of the room. Because <laughs> that was not going to be, I'm not going to join things right now. You go, oh, big thing, learn to say no. Oh my God. That's a big one. Learn to say no to things. Don't say, you guy can't always say yes. Because your time is really precious. And they're only going to get more precious. But I also say yes. Say yes to helping other people out. That's always good, you know, but don't commit to things um, that are going to distract. So your time is precious, but you are not. <laughs> no. well, and, <laughs> and if someone offers you their advice or their feedback, whether you think it's going to be legitimate or not, that's a great opportunity to say yes as well, right? Uh, offering to mentor or offering to help out. You always say yes there? Yeah, I'm very self serving. So when you asked me that one time, I, I kind of didn't want to do it, but I made myself do it mm -hmm. because I, I'm kind of in isolation working in the factory. Mm -hmm. So I make myself do things like this because I need to get out and talk. Sure. And, and it helps me. It helps you clear the cobwebs. Mm -hmm. You should you should get out. I think public appearances you should you should say yes to. Joining clubs, probably not. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, 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 I'm, I'm a Catholic and the nice of Columbus are, we're asking a lot. I was like, yeah, it looks cool. I like the hats and stuff. No, thanks. Not right now. Maybe, maybe my sixties I'll do it. Not right now. You know, I mean, it's too many groups. I don't want to. Right what did your kids turn out after living through this experience? Um, well, we were funny. And another experience that people can do because you're Japanese and we have a lot of Japanese culture in our family. We were big Suzuki parents. Suzuki is a musical education. Suzuki actually moved to um, Weimar, Germany in the 1930s. And actually Switzerland, he went to Switzerland. He lived with Einstein when Einstein was nobody. He lived in his apartment and they played music together. Now Suzuki lives in Nagasaki, which of course is blown up. Um, he, his family made violins. He taught his niece how to play a violin. He made a miniature violin for her. And that started the Suzuki program. And it was famous, like Bill Donnie knew back in the 70s, all the Suzuki kids, you know, and it became a movement. It still is a very big movement. And the pedagogy of Suzuki is, is to, um, it's called the mother tongue in Japanese. I don't know the word for mother tongue is in Japanese. But the idea is that the, the mother would, in utero, listen to classical music and start playing the violin in utero, or babies in utero. 
right? And then when the baby was born, they'd be playing Brahms and Beethoven. And this, it basically just surrounded the kid with classical music and beauty. And then they learn to play a few notes and then play Twinkle, right? And the idea is, usually when kids play the piano, they start when they're like seven or eight, way too late. They start, and they, they, they go to a, a teacher and they play Furalis until they practice until they recital. Uh, and they play, da, 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 and they play it. And it's the last time they'll ever play it. After the stupid recital, they got it, they're done with it, right? That's how piano is usually taught in America. But Suzuki is like, you learn Twinkle and you play it the day you die. It's not that you learn how to play it, but you always go back to play it more and more beautifully because you're, you're an artist. It's not about getting through the song. It's about finding the, the essence of the beauty of the song, right? It doesn't matter which song it is. It's your tone on your violin or your cello. So my kid was, a, my Luke became a cellist at three and a half. Alex started a little bit later in violin at five. Uh, Luke now is studying his master's degree in, in Graz, Germany. Um, he likes Europe, but he's going to have to come home. He's expensive, but... So he became a, a, a classically trained uh, musician. He wants to be a pro. Alec um, liked the fiddle that he played to a certain level in high school. He said, I want to stop. I want to do something else. So that's my kids. Uh, so they come out different, right? They come out totally different. You think they're going to be, oh, they're my kids. Oh, they're totally different people. Even as babies, you could talk. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you guys want to do a little bit of sketching or you want to do a little building? <laughs> we just, yeah, yeah. The start of yeah. Little, little, little about, yeah. Yeah, a little bit about. Let's okay, grab a pencil real quick. I'll show you so uh, in the in the in the, 18th, in the in the 16th century, uh, 1600s, so it was probably the 15th century, there was a family that was very concerned about the future of art in Italy because the Germans and the, and the Dutch were really passing the Germans and their commissions, and, they, and it was the Karachi family, okay? And they hired a guy named Eduardo Falati to basically teach, uh, help them learn, how, uh, create a curriculum that would teach kids how to draw relatively easily so they could make, um, they could make, uh, uh, they could learn how to draw the body. Now, the body is one of the hardest things to draw. So I'm going to show you a real quick thing. This is how they, this is how the Italians taught their kids how to draw a face, okay? So grab your pencil. With a short stick, not a regular nine, but a short stick. And then you go from the bottom of the stick over here to the middle with an arch like that, a little arc. And then from the middle of that arc, come back this way and go back that way. And that's the neck. To show the roundness of that neck, all I have to do is make a C here to emphasize that's a round thing, okay? This is an old Renaissance trick. Remember the Karachi family back in Bologna, uh, they invented the kind of the school of Baroque drawing and painting. They knew that they had to teach little kids how to draw quickly because they had a big demand to make art, okay? So they had to make, uh, they had, so they started a school, an academy. So you make a line from the bottom, a horizontal line going through the throwing through this line here to make a four that's where the nose goes remember the nose you make a c with a little hook like that like a little tadpole shape and then come around like that for the nose renaissance nose goes right here like that okay and it curves right into the forehead you, where does the eye go where does the eye go the eye goes halfway so the, the mid part of the head is where the eye goes right in there and you make a line like that and like that this comes over this line okay and then you have the lid there and then the eye, eyebrow there here you have a c three c and a chin c three c and a chin and then the famous italian phrase bada bing bada bam Bada boom, or bada bang, bada boom, okay? That means that that's where the mouth goes. Okay, so that's where the lips go right there. And then the ear goes right back behind the jaw and over the jaw right here is where the ear goes. And the ear is shaped kind of like a C with a hook with an inside C, like a fancy backward question mark, a little C there, and you make this curved Y, okay? And that's the ear. And then hair obeys the rules of physics. So let's say this is a girl with a scrunchie back here, 
Okay, yeah, make those loves and likes. I love those, and it helps our video get more circulation on Facebook. So please, please, please hit those buttons. Okay, so if you make a scrunchie, then physically that hair will be pulled back, okay? And the hair will obey those little cables that are here. They'll obey the laws of physics, and they'll go around the sphere of the head, all around, all like a little long, longitudinal lines on a sphere, all the back to the scrunchie, and they'll pop out here. You, you can make it either cut off like that, or you can make it come down in an S rule like that, like a mane on a horse, right? And then here, if she's got bangs, these errant hairs will also um, obey the rules of physics. It'll either be little C's or little errant hairs over here will be little S's, okay? And there's also errant hairs back here. I call them errant hairs, okay? And that's how you do a profile, okay? But how about the front of the body? How about the, well, right off the bat, I'll show you the quick way to draw the front of the head. It's rounder on top, more pointy on the bottom. It's an egg, right? And you, it's really important you have a line of symmetry right here that goes through here. This, this line of symmetry, we have bilateral symmetry. So you should divide it in half that way. You should also divide it in half this way because these are where the eyes go, okay? We could always change the proportions of how fat and skinny the head is later, but it's important to know how to organize the face, really important. Remember, I started teaching this to inner city kids in Chicago, and I had to come in with kids who had no real art background, and I wanted to teach them Renaissance techniques right off the bat. So I went back to the Renaissance and found out how they, did it, how they taught their kids, and this is how they did it. How big should the eyes be, and where should the eyes be? Well, we know they should be along this line. Here's the general rule of eyes. Whatever distance you have between the eyes is about how big the eyes are. So if this is how the distance is, then each eye should be that distance. Seems simple enough. And you can make a simple, we're gonna be simple today. We're not gonna be super complex. So we'll make an arc for the upper lid, an arc for the lower lid, a little moon shape here because the eye doesn't, you don't see the whole eye because that would be like right before a person is like ax murdered, they'd make an eye like that. People don't make eyes like this, okay? Their eyes more relaxed, okay? And then you have uh, the eyebrow goes here, you have a, the tear duct, there's a gland here, right? And that's the tear gland, the lacrimal gland, and it makes tears that rain down in your eyeball, and then it, they drain right here in your lacrimal gland down here. So there's a swelling right here. So it's all part of one structure. This whole, so this beautiful shape I'm making, okay, is part of the same structure, okay? Then you make a, a, a normal, I call a normal V, and that normal V tells you where the nose goes. Remember the profile nose goes like this? Well, the, 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 the front nose is similar. You make, you, you make, a, line, you make a shape like this, and that's where the lids go, the, the, the nostrils go. And then you make the wings. And then you make the ball. And just suggest this. You don't make this too dark, okay? Under here goes a shape like a teardrop, right? A little teardrop. And the saying goes, the angels in heaven pinch the little baby's mouths before they, go to, they are born so they don't give away all the secrets in the angel's workshop. So you have a little fingerprint here of where your, your lips were pinched closed. Okay, so you make the little dimple, then you make a, a little uh, a V shape with a little curly cue here and here for the upper lips, and then the lower lips, and then a little dimple here for the chin. Okay, I call this the cheeky cheek line. This kind of emphasizes the zygomatic arch and the jaw going in, and then the, the, the flare of the jaw here down, the flare of the jaw here down. Okay, and then of course it's a very simplified face. And then the neck, don't be literal. You wanna bring the neck down a little bit this way. And then because it's the front muscles here that start here and go t towards the ear back here. And then there's the trapezius muscle in the back. So the neck is a combination of, of this form here and this form here. So, and then it kind of looks in the end like that. But it's not really that. It's really this and this coming together. And then the ear would go here shorthand for the ear, and then you can make any kind of hair you want. We'll keep it simple and make a little side, middle part here, okay? Very simplistic uh, view, uh, idea of the face, but I want to get you used to simplifying. Remember, uh, this isn't even the most abstract view of the face. This is the most abstract face we can think of, right? The word face. And then we have this, right? And then we have maybe this, Maybe even oh, give the little Disney eyes here. Ooh, right? And then we can start to remove more and more abstraction. And Picasso and many artists of the 20th century um, uh, had a middle abstraction between this and the, and the picture of a face, like a photograph, right? But we can keep adding more and more until we get down to a kind of organized idea that's still in the doodle realm, that's still in the doodle realm, but it gives you, because you've measured right, it gives you a kind of idea 
of a person that's, that's much better and, and, and sympathetic than this, right? So we're moving from abstraction to that. So that's, generally speaking, the, the face. Now, we talk about the body. We have to talk about proportion. Proportion. Because proportion is about how things are, are sized relative to each other. And we measure the body in terms of how many heads long we are or tall. We, 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 we measure it by heads, okay? That sounds weird. So it's not how tall you are, but how many heads tall you are. So let's start with the baby. Let's make a person four heads tall. Four heads tall? Yeah, four. One, two, three, four. Baby land. Okay, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to, take, we're going to make the head, baby head. Now, babies don't have eyes in the middle of their head. Their eyes are a little bit lower because they're babies. They're kind of freaky looking. They've got big ears, little tiny nose, little lips, right? Big head of curly hair, like my little son Luke had, a little curly hair, a little baby neck, okay? And then they have, a, now the human body's divided into things like a bug. We have a bug. We have the head, bug head. Then we have the bug thorax, thorax, and then we have the bug abdomen, and we have the legs, and the, the limbs attach to the thorax, okay? They don't attach to the abdomen. Okay, so here we have, ba the, we, but the thorax in the human being is a rib cage. It's a thing that's shaped like this, okay? So here we have the baby rib cage, baby rib cage, right? Baby, baby thorax, so you have the rib cage, and then you, uh, then you have the, the thorax, and you have the abdomen, okay? Baby abdomen comes right in there like that, then the baby hips, Big old chunky chunk baby legs, chunky chunk baby legs. And we'll get into details later of what I mean by all this, okay? And then we have the baby uh, shoulders, baby arms, and the baby arms go down to about mid here. They should meet about mid thigh, okay? And if I put a pamper on this little guy, put a pamper on him, little baby feet, you can see a little little unitard for the baby, kind of little Dago T for the baby right here. So here you go. So you have baby, baby proportions look kind of like this. So they're little aliens babies are with these huge heads. The eyes aren't quite, and that's when we make aliens like, like uh, E.T. We keep the eyes nice and low to make them look like babies. Disney learned that if they want a sympathetic cartoon, they keep the eyes big and low, and it gives you that sympathetic baby fe feature that our, us humans are programmed to love and adore. So that's baby. That's four heads tall. If you move to five heads tall, one, two, three, four, five. You're going to get a feel for a, more of a child that's maybe three, four, or five years old. So you're going to get uh, the, the head here. Okay, we'll put the eyes more in the middle. It could be a young child, though. Neck. We're going to have the collarbone goes here, thorax, and you're going to have the rib cage, okay? Rib cage. Now remember, the rib cage goes in here. It goes in. Your ribs start to converge inward. And you have a gap here, a negative space here. So you have the rib cage. So your your thorax is like this. That rib cage is like that. Okay. So you know, learn that form. It's a beautiful egg shaped form too. Then you have the abdomen. And then you have here. You have the hip structure. It's a, it's a line that comes like this, and then the legs go into the hips. And here's how I make the legs. I go like this. The upper leg, the upper thigh, on this person's leg over here, the, on uh, their left, but our, right over, right over here, goes like this. You have the groin muscle, lower thigh, and then your upper thigh, right? And then you have a kneecap. Then you have the uh, outside of the lower leg, which is a bone, the calf, comes down the muscle into an ankle. Then you have a heel, and you have a bone that comes out like that, and you have the toes, okay? And that's a leg, okay? And that's the Renaissance, they really learned how to make the shorthand of that leg, okay? And that comes here, and these are skinnier legs, not chunky chunks like those little babies. Skinnier legs. And you can make kids as leggy as you want. I could bring this leg up higher if I want to. I, I lengthened it a little bit so it don't look weird. So. You're seeing now, this is the, the proportions, and then the arm, I go like this. Deltoid, bicep, forearm. This is the wrist, right? And then here's the hand. Okay, this is the thumb and the rest, rest of the hand here. Okay, so deltoid, bicep, tricep, forearm, hand, deltoid, bicep, tricep. Take that, boom, boom, boom. Such a shorthand, but it has a lot of power. 
forearm. Wrist is here, then you have the thumb, hand, right? Joint, ball joint here, joint for the elbow, joint for the wrist. Joint for the knee, and there's a joint near for the ball joint of the hip, joint for the ankle, okay? And the neck and the spine are all well, the joints, right? So that is a, a child that's five heads tall. Five heads tall. So what happens if we go to six heads tall? So I don't know what the age would be for six, but I'm thinking it'd be probably around a 10-year-old. So we go one, two, three, four, five, and six. This will be where the heel lands. And the, the foot will actually come down farther. So we have a head. We'll make it a narrower head now. Okay, a long egg like this with the eyes would go right in there. Of course, I'm, I'm sketching, so I'm not gonna be super realistic, but I wanted to give you an idea of how this proportion works. Okay, six heads tall. Neck goes in, and then the trapezius is there. Remember, head, neck, trapezius, right? Then the, 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 the collarbone, okay, is here. The clavicle is here, the collarbone, okay? And then that's where the rib cage starts, right here. And there's a, there's a chest plate there, so you have the, the bottom part of the rib cage is there, and so you have the thorax like this. The rib cage is not that big, okay, but it protects, the thorax protects all the important organs to keep you alive, like the lungs and heart there, right? So you have the rib cage, and then you'll know, see, this shows you how art is really a STEM field. That's why it should be called STEAM, because art, done right, done the Renaissance way, is, is, is as scientific as they get in the elementary level and middle school level, I think. So you have the thorax head, then you have the abdomen right here, the abdomen, Okay, and the abdomen comes down to the bottom of your body here, and then you have here, depending on a girl or boy, it's a little bit different, but you have a flare out of the hips, okay? We'll make this person a little bit leggier, so we'll make it up here, we'll make a, the, the, the inner part of the leg, the, the, the thigh, outer thigh, knee, knee, outer leg, inner leg, feet, See, his feet uh, coming in with the, 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 the lower leg here. There's an ankle, right? And then what happens is this. You have a heel, and you have the, the line that goes like that to show you the ball of your big toe there, the ball of the foot. And the foot comes in like that, and there's toes here. So it's an illusion. It's an optical illusion because you see your four. It's called foreshortening. You're, you're seeing. You're not getting to see the profile of the foot. Okay, unless I mean ballerina, I had her do some ballerina move. You're seeing a four short where the front of the foot is moving in front of the back of the foot, right? But again, I'm doing short, I'm not gonna worry about that right now. I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna do uh, where the, the, the lack, the um, collarbone, clavicle comes into the back shoulder blade and that's where the arm starts right here and you have a deltoid, bicep, tricep, she's longer now, forearm, wrist, hand, so the hand should touch right around there. Deltoid, bicep, tricep, Elbow, forearm, wrist, hand, okay? Now, if I give them clothes, they become more recognizable because we're not used to seeing naked people, right? So if I get, let's say I give her a skirt, okay, and a shirt, and hair, it looks like um, someone who might be in, I don't know, third grade. Okay, They're, or a very short person. So p p some people around the world have different body proportions, but from a, a, a kind of a European, Northern European idea of, um, of uh, body proportion, she could be a Scandinavian girl in fourth grade, right? So there, and that was, what was that? That was six heads tall. Now, um, if we jump, let's jump to uh, seven heads now. So seven heads tall is getting more to teenager. So one, two, three, four, Five, six, and seven heads tall. So head, neck. Make those little lines there for the collarbone, then the trapezius muscles in the back, and then um, we have here the chest plate, and we have the rib cage, the thorax, we call it the thorax, and then we have this wasp abdomen shape here. I make it a shape like, I think of a shape like that. Later on, you'll learn that the abdomens go here, the ab muscles go there, right? But it's not important right now because we're, we're abstracting, okay? And then, so you see one thing goes, the optical illusion is one thing is going into another thing, right? Just like we did with um, the C rule. So, and then, see so the abdomen, you have a flare out of the hips. If it's a woman, the flare out's larger than the man's, okay? 
And the women tend to look like they're leggy and have longer legs than men. And men have bigger shoulders here, generally speaking. And then we'd have the, 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 the groin area and the inner part of the thigh. Boom, right there like that. In art, we're always exaggerating to some extent because we want to see what we're doing. You get much more subtlety when you do portraits and you get into specific people. But when you're doing general drawing, you want to be a little bit exaggerated, see what you're doing, see how it all lines up. It's not as important to be you know, totally like, this is Julie and this is her mom wants to look just like Julie. Okay, so again, thorax, hips, rib cage, thor uh, abdomen, thorax, and then we have the arm here. Deltoid, and I say it, so remember, deltoid, bicep, tricep, forearm, wrist, hand, deltoid, bicep, tricep, boom, boom, boom. This is Leonardo line. Leonardo made this line famous in his drawings. Boom, boom, boom. It's a beautiful line. It really shows what the body is doing. Forearm, get the wrist here, arm, hand. I'm making just a simple, if I made this hand bigger, you can see this would be the thumb there. The knuckle here, fingers, wrist here, right? I'm not gonna do that right now. And this is getting in more teenage years, okay? This could be a 12 to 13, 14 year old, depending on, or, or an adult, okay? And then finally, we'll, we'll end with eight heads tall. Wow, eight heads tall. And see, now you're getting into proportions of what we call like um, uh, proportional beauty standards, okay? We, w supermodels tend to be, um, look really long. And that's because they look long because they are, they are multiple heads tall they have, they, they, and they, they get skinny, so it accentuates that. So you have three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. That's eight heads tall, right? Yeah, so we have the head here, one, and then the neck, thorax. And then we have the thorax here. It's not, we, they show that rib cage. It's thinner than you think. The rib cage is thinner. Then you have the abdomen. And then you have the flare of the hips. They go out like that. Think of it this way. Like, this is a muscle, but there's a bone in there that looks like this. It looks like a butterfly, and that's the hip bone, okay? It looks like that. And the leg bone is a ball joint, and it goes in there, right? And it comes in like that, okay? The ball joint comes out and it goes in, that bone goes in. And then down here, the lower leg, the bone flares out. There's two bones in the lower leg. And the, the, this leg, the bone flares out. There's a second bone inside there and then they go to the ankles down there, right? That's why it looks like there's a flare out of flesh here and then you have groin, outer thigh, groin. And then here you have it, it's almost it's in line with the bone here. Right, and that's why a woman's body looks like that because their hips are bigger for giving birth, right? So that's why it looks like that. So, and there's a reason why things look the way they do. So uh, here we have the flare, the, 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 the groin and the inner thigh, boom, boom, like that. Knees, I just simplify the knees here and then you come down like this, remember this guy? And here, to the ankle. And the ankle comes in. The, the angle of the ankle is like this. And, and the leg here, and on this leg here, the ankles always aim up towards the inside of the body. They're aimed up. Okay? And then the heel, foot, heel, foot, deltoid, bicep, tr tricep, forearm, hand, deltoid, bicep, tricep, Forearm, hand. Your hand should be about mid thigh. You can tell how long this person looks. Now, if it's a woman, she's going to have breasts. Okay, so they, they would, and they would, their flesh that attaches to the outside of the rib cage. Okay, and we'll suggest that with just this line, we'll give her one of those sports kinds of tops, so you can see it. She'd have a little bit more flesh here, and then we'll give her a bottom here, so you can see like a sport bottom. There's a very long person, right? Or give her a skirt, it doesn't matter to me, right? But you can tell this is a long person. She's sad, I'm not sure if she's sad. Okay, so you see how long that person looks, okay? So that's eight heads tall. We'll stop at eight heads tall. Okay, so again, to review, 
the way I organize the body is you want a line of symmetry. You want a line, you want to organize it, especially in the beginning. You want, you want to line everything up, just like a carpenter has a, uh, has a line up the house and make it so it stands straight. So they have a plumb line with a little weight on so they know that things go up and down. They have a level. So you want to make sure you're leveling everything off. You want, to, you, want, you want to start with drawing standing people, not people sitting looking at you. That's really hard to do. Just looking at the front view of a person and then organize them according to how many heads tall they are. One, two, three, four, and five, okay? And then when you, you commit to a five-headed tall person, then you'll know you have fun, make the face. Halfway is where the eyes go. Eyes are one eye apart, remember? Eyes are one eye, that distance apart. So nose, lips, ear, and the, coming from doodling, coming from fun, don't worry about making mistakes. Do, do lots of these and have fun with it. You don't always draw all the lines I showed you, but you, you could draw them lightly, show with it, just draw quickly where that rib, that rib cage thorax goes. Then the tummy goes here. So you know you're gonna put the legs like this. Right? That person is very bow-legged. And the mistakes are funny and they, they could be fine too. So obviously this is a little person. Deltoid, bicep, tricep. I do, and I, I think it's good to just do hundreds of these things, okay? And this looks like a little, oh, this is adorable. So this would be a person maybe in a little junior gymnast, right? Or junior wrestler, a, a little five-year-old wrestler. That's hilarious, right? See, I did that? Okay. Okay, now these guys here, this is a cheat. Now, if drawings on your thing, give an app called SketchUp. Sketchup, you know SketchUp, right? Because SketchUp actually will render for um, printers, right? Yeah. yeah. So SketchUp is like, like, like the, it's like AutoCAD for dummies, okay? Because you can actually make things on SketchUp that'll print. It's like kind of like, it still acts like an AutoCAD drawing, right? Could you even say you said the STL file, right? Yeah. So STL file is like stereo photography. Yeah. The STL file. So it has like dot STL. And that's what you want to you want to have an STL file if you want to print. And you want to print if you have a prototype. So if your computer not savvy, you ask somebody if they know SketchUp. You don't have to hire like an official draftsman because a lot of kids know SketchUp now. A lot of kids are on Tinkercad and that kind of stuff. So if you can hire a kid. I always say, if you can do it, hire a kid. I said it live, <laughs> child labor, baby. <laughs> Just get the parents' permission. So um, anyway, so uh, this stuff is isometric drawing. Uh, usually we think of perspective as this kind of stuff. Oh, that's my eraser. You think of, you know, you, I don't know if you took art in school, but uh, perspective, they say, oh, you got to have a vanishing point, the horizon line. But most of the perspective, like on, on cartoons and stuff like uh, Simpsons and on um, uh, South Park, they don't use this kind of perspective necessarily. This, this, is, uh, this is like one point perspective where the vanishing or these get smaller as they go away. You don't need that if you're designing. All you can know is a real parallel. So if you have a shape, let's say it's square, you want to draw a cube, just draw another square the same size that's off to the left a little bit, like on a diagonal, and just connect the corners. Or don't make it invisible. Let's say it's a house, make a triangle here, make a triangle there. Don't connect the corners, then you don't have to show that. So you can do like a, 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 a oval, lines go up, but the same oval here. That paper though is like training wheels because the paper, you can draw on it. Try to find the cube in the paper. So this paper will help you sketch your product. See, I was telling somebody, I'm not a software guy. I'm from the world of things. Okay, I'm a designer of things, obviously, right? So, but I think visualizing, even if you're coming with an idea for a website or an app, having a sense of design, having a sense of visualizing will really help you. Sometimes words don't do it. I'll make a big one here. So I can go like this. Let's 
Again, so you can trace a three dimensional object, right? So my object is going to come up this way because I'm making a new bird feeder that actually captures the birds so I can relocate them because I don't like starlings. So you're going to sell it low and it's a starling trap. So I gotta describe it to my tool guy. He's gonna make a cage for me, right? With a trap door right here, right? So I can make an isometric drawing so you can get an idea of like the shape of the thing. Since he's a tool guy, he understands shape really well. You don't. So you can communicate within your idea. Does that make sense? And you can see a little bird going in the cage and being trapped and angry in the cage, for example. But so this paper is really helpful. If you get it, I got it free on Google. It's not and printed it up. Okay. So this isometric drawing paper. It's very, very helpful. So those are, uh, those are two. I'm a big, it's my prejudice. I'm a big believer in drawing. And uh, if you're more of a mouse guy, you know, you could draw with a mouse too. You know, you can. Any other questions today? I really appreciate you guys' opportunity for me to talk because it's good for me to get out there and, and uh, stretch my whatever. Yeah, you know? It's really great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mr. For, for coming out to do this too. Absolutely. Good. Did you get a chance to put the blocks at all? Any questions about the blocks? Did you figure it out? I didn't tell you. The egg in, we used to tell the kids, you put the male and the female. I can't. <laughs> 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 then Maria came up with the egg in the nest. Now we're saying that the beak gets the egg. The little cartoon bird now. The beak gets yeah. the egg. Yeah, you got to right now. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. I have a few. I brought a few toys to show you guys. Um, but yeah, so this is an idea. This is a new design for coffee cup product. Uh, one of the things the customers are telling us is, "Do a dinosaur?" Because I had a. I have a, my first animal was a baby sea turtle, which is selling fine. We thought that'd be cute. But they were everybody's saying, yeah, why aren't you doing dinosaurs? I'm like, yeah, kids kind of go crazy for dinosaurs. Like, yeah, kids go freaking nuts over dinosaurs. <laughs> and they don't have to be Lego dinosaurs. They can be your dinosaurs. So we're coming out with dinosaurs pretty soon. Awesome. So, so yeah. when you, when you, and they move. When you package them, so you, you sell it, you sell them with instructions on how to build a specific design. Yeah, all of these come with instructions. Okay. And we move to clear containers, and a lot of our competition now for us. So what will happen is you'll get a feedback loop going on at Coach Chambers, and you'll be imitating and stealing ideas from people. They must have stolen ideas from you. So we took this idea from another group that had clear containers, and then another group, they're Lego, a Lego kind of company, but not Lego, they went with clear too. So clear is going trending now. Mm -hmm. The best thing about clear is though, is that people see the value, they see it. Um, we call it buying Chinese air in Target, where you're buying literally Chinese air. You get a, because the boxes are shaped like, the boxes are designed to be signs. That's why they get really mad if they put their, if a manufacturer sees your stuff in a store, put in like a book, defeats the whole purpose of the cereal box. Yeah. You want to see its crunchies, right? Not like, you know, the little barcode and the crap. Like a bag of chips. Yeah. Cool. A bag of chips is a sign. Yeah, they don't want to. So this is not a sign as much, but this is a value proposition. Ah, value proposition, right? It's heavy. There's no bullshit in it. I'm, I know what I'm buying. Now, and nobody cares about, this is 223 pieces. It was Lego, 223 pieces can be this many bucks. Because they, they, they'll say the little knob on top of the thing is a piece. They don't care. So, <laughs> so yeah, these, so, so the, the, we were trying to fight the piece count war. Like we can't win, our pieces are pretty big. So why don't we just say, you're getting this in a tube. This is actually a beef jerky canister which is really good because food grade materials, they're safe for one thing, but also a lot of guys buy beef jerky and they're not gonna quit. Mm -hmm. So in terms of supply chain, 
using, my mom's like, don't tell people it's, it's food stuff. Lots of packaging goes into food, into a commodity. It's, it happens all the time. But the nice thing about the supply chain in America is, you, as a small manufacturer, if you're, if you're going to make a product, you're small, you're going to want to find open architecture, off-the-shelf things that they're not going to, because they're not going to cater to you. If you make a specialty box and things get crazy in the factory, they're going to cut you because Charmin or Kleenex just wanted 10,000 million boxes. So you're, not, you're out, right? But if you say, I'm using these canisters, they're always trying to get rid of some more because they're the distributors trying. So it's not the dumbest thing. So we buy a label and uh, manufacturing is very easy to manufacture. Yeah, the blocks are made in Bloomington, Illinois by Midwest Molding Solution, who, um, again, supply chain, their number one customer was Mitsubishi, and now it's guess who? Rivian, exactly. But they also do the firearm guy that's the little things, the magnets, the little mm -hmm. rods, and they also do the guy that the planter too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of small guys. And the guy who makes a little squishy ball, mm -hmm. that guy? Yeah, I don't know his name. Yeah. Yeah, you get to know everybody who makes things around here. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I've made a SpaceX rocket. I just spray painted it silver. So, um, huh? Never millions. No, I we have a we have a uh, you saw my my uh, skyscraper the, the Empire State Building. It took sixteen thousand blocks. And it's like twelve feet tall. It's been everywhere all over the country. So yeah. yeah. So I'm a big, you know, Elon Musk voice is about, you know, it's too bad Americans don't love manufacturing. Manufacturing is awesome. He's right. Manufacturing is wonderful. It's fun. Because you're like, you're making something and then you're mass producing it. It's just fun to be, it's a fun process. Yeah. And then to see people actually like your stuff, you know, we're, of course, we're not we're not killing in terms of popularity right now, but we're we're growing, we're steady growth. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, the software people, their formula is invest in the front end of the talent, and then the thing should run by itself, and it shouldn't cost anything to run it. And the investor is going to make a ton of a ton of money right away, right? Mm -hmm. That seems to be the software idea. Manufacturing is more of a slow burn and you're trying to make the legacy brand and you're trying to make something that's going to last for a long time. So a lot of investors don't like that formula because they want to get in and get out. But that's also really high risk too. Yeah. So yeah. We, don't think, we don't see ourselves as a high risk because uh, we're in a very big legacy space that, unless we run out of kids. Yeah. And there are markets where they're like Europe's running out of kids. There are places where there's no kids or less kids. Japan's kind of having a problem too, right? With reproducing yourselves. Like the birth rates are going down. And that's why Elon Musk is going against the grain. All, almost all the billionaires are saying we need less people in the world, more resources for fewer people. And Elon Musk is saying we got to start breeding you guys because we're using a critical mass where our species needs more people. Because every 100 people you make, you make a really good scientist. You just can't rely on a small group of people to pull this up. So I, and he goes against uh, the, the um, Malthusian argument. You know who Malthus is? Thomas Malthus was a famously wrong guy in the 18th century, who was the first person to have access to world, world around information. He was working for the British East India Company College. The British East India Company was the first world around corporation, actually the Dutch East India Company. And the British, but the U.S. flag is actually the British, the, the, the East India Company flag. A little bit of reconfiguration. So this corporation, the East India Company, put all their information from around the world data, its economic, uh, geographic, demographic data, into one place, East India College. And I'm talking to this now. And, and Thomas Malthus was this guy who looked at the data and said, judging from the geometric rate of production and arithmetic rate of food production and the growth of the uh, populations, we're going to all run out of food and we're, we're going to perish. We don't stop reading. And that's where that idea came from. And 5,000 best selling books later, with your hair on fire books saying we're all going to die and stop, people actually all believe it. But there's no proof. And now people like Fuller came around and said, actually, with ephemeralization, we're doing more with less. The car in the 1930s that weighed two tons 
that had, that got like maybe 10 miles to the gallon that held five people dangerously, right? That car, you can make 10 cars today with that much material. They're driving five times faster, 10 times better gas mileage, and they'll all live in a collision. So that's called ephemeralization. They're, they're optimized. So you're, you're getting more and more performance with less and less resources. And when you look at that and the number of patents now, they can't make the horizontal long enough on the curve to keep that curve not going vertical. There's so much innovation going on right now. And that means that the fallout of that innovation is everyone, they're going to have a hard time finding things for people to do because they're becoming automatic. So things are getting better. That's the point is things are getting so much better. We don't need less people because you guys live in the grand belt. You know, it's like, we got lots of food, mm -hmm. you know, but people don't like you saying that mm -hmm. because they think if you believe that, then you're not going to have the urgency to fix things. I think we should still have the urgency to fix things. Now I'm just telling you my opinion. I think I like your car. <laughs> <laughs> I like your 3D printer guy. I mean, they're 3D printing like uh, Martian colonies now. They're thinking about making 3D printing in the moon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen the architecture? The Japanese are really good. Not the Chinese. The Chinese. And the Dutch are printing buildings out of concrete. With these giant gimbal printers the size of this building. And they're printing houses. There's a company in New York. Is there really? Yeah, we were thinking about working. Is there one in Austin? Yeah, it's not, it's not really high tech. The software is like the highest tech thing about printers, right? Yeah, I think they, they usually use two guys to print the machine. And that's when that becomes the equation. When you have two guys on the site instead of 70 or 60, or that's when it changes. Because labor is what that changes it.